what I'm going to do today is weave together my travel stories with other 18th and 19th century, mostly 19th century explorers, and talk a little bit about Timbuktu and its role in, uh, in West Africa and a little bit about the Mali Empire. My own personal travel narratives, and then you'll hear other travel narratives, and we're going to kind of weave it in together. I went to Timbuktu <laughs> and back, and it was just so <laughs> exciting. Uh, my, the title of my talk is called West Africa is not just about slave castles, uh, tales from Timbuktu and the glorious Mali Empire. My specialty in terms of history, I'm a southern Africanist, so I know Zimbabwe and South Africa really well. I used to live there. I played a little song for you by Ali uh, Farka Touré, who is uh, Mali's most famous mu musician. And you kind of get a little sense that it's a little bluesy. And Mali music is a little bluesy, and they will claim that American blues and jazz really has African roots. And if you think about African American music, it has lots of African influences, right? And it's one of the very unique things about American culture, right? That is uniquely American, uniquely African American, right? Blues, jazz country, even rock and roll, all of those kinds of music. And this is what Timbuktu looks like. The reason Timbuktu is so large in people's imaginations is because from Egypt's Cairo to Timbuktu it took about two to three months. So people traveled for a long time in order to get to Timbuktu. And even in Mali, it's very far. It's in a lot of dirt roads and the journey is incredibly large. And there are, it's uh, surrounded by desert on all sides. So when you come upon Timbuktu, it's like, wow, there is Timbuktu. What is the significance of Timbuktu? First of all, you have this Indian Ocean trade. You had a Silk Road trade, which linked to um, big trade routes like the Trans-Saharan trade. So from Cairo all the way to Timbuktu, people would take two to three months to cross the desert. And it wasn't just trade items, but people started trading in ideas. But Mali was famous for things like gold, ivory, some slaves. Camels have humps so that they can hold a lot of water. They don't need to be um, given as much water as horses do. So they can handle this two, three month journey across the Sahara. So at one point, uh, there were tons of people traveling this route, right? Thousands of camels. So it takes about 70 to 90 days. This Trans-Saharan trade started in the seventh century BCE. So it's been happening for thousands of years, two to three months, and then 25,000 camels at its height. For me, this was such an exciting moment, like touring the town of Timbuktu, the cities. Many people still live in nomadic houses. Timbuktu also has some amazing um, sites, and one of them is a famous university called Sankore. Books and documents that they have from this particular period of time. So it's really fascinating. Lots of things happening around, uh, around in that part of the world. Now, just to get a comparison of universities around the world at the time. Um, you have a number of universities in Asia, uh, and one in the Roman Empire on the eastern side, right in Constantinople. But generally, think about Western Europe only starting universities right around the time that uh, San Corea was already kind of blooming. And it's a UNESCO heritage site. So who were these people of Timbuktu originally? Uh, and they still are. They speak different Berber languages. Berber is just a generic word for barbarian that came from the Greeks, right? All the people in North Africa. Some of these people you might have heard as Moors. Some of these people conquered parts of Spain and Portugal. Timbuktu, it's, it's not just one place that explorers went to. Timbuktu was just one part. This kind of mud architecture, typical of Berber architecture. So Berber are a number of um, indigenous North African link, or I have seen architecture like this in Egypt and have taken photographs of it. And there's, it's kind of all throughout parts of North Africa. Modern Tuareg, they're the people in blue, the blue men of the Sahara, you might have heard them called. And they actually wear blue. Some of my Ghanaian musician friends, they bought blue headscarves. And it's actually very beautiful when you're out in the dusty desert, you can see the blue. And blue is this sign of royalty or a kind of wealthy, aristocrat kind of a color. Example. So the Berber Touareg are the, the distance, distance. traveler? Great distance? 
they're, they're different people in, in different parts of North Africa, and Berber is like one of those very generic terms. Okay. okay. Talk, because there's hundreds, <coughs> hundreds of different Berber languages okay. all over North Africa.